if you had been just around your neighborhood friends, you would not be the Nick Cannon that we're speaking to right now. Facts. It was glorified. I definitely was wearing my my dickies and yeah. you know a certain colors and the chucks. Was it a was it a crip set, blood set? It was, it was a blood set. Blood. Pull out on me, I so can't you had talk guys crazy. Pull out, pull out guns on you. Absolutely. After after you got famous. Two, three months ago. Three months ago, you had a gun pulled on. Hundred percent. A lot of celebrities like to put on a tough persona, flaunting guns, rocking specific colors, or dropping certain references in their music or public appearances to seem like gangsters. But when it comes to real life gang involvement, not many stars can actually claim that experience. Nick Cannon, however, isn't just all talk. He's got real ties to one of the most notorious gangs out there, the Bloods. His father, James Cannon, was one of the founding members of the Lincoln Park Bloods. His pops is one of the oh, first shit. 10 homies from my turf, you feel me? Whoa. Yeah, bar. Oh, yeah. Nick Cannon Pops is one of the original Lincoln Park Bloods. So yeah, Nick Cannon's life could have taken a very different path if things had turned out differently. But let's dig deeper into his story. Nick Cannon's career is like a Swiss army knife of the entertainment world. He's done it all. He started young, joining a rap group as a teenager and scoring a deal with Jive Records. Not stopping there, he showed off his comedic chops on Nickelodeon's All That and Keenan and Kel. By 2002, he had his own show on the network, The Nick Cannon Show. Movies followed, more albums dropped, and he became a familiar face on TV hosting gigs. But before all this fame, Nick Cannon grew up in a place where gang life was just part of the scenery. In an interview with Vlad TV, Nick Cannon opened up about his upbringing in Southeast San Diego, a neighborhood where gang culture was the norm. He mentioned he never officially joined a gang, but it was impossible not to be influenced by that environment. He reminisced about wearing certain colors and styles that were popular during the gang culture boom of the early 90s. Man, you know what? I wouldn't say I joined a gang, Cannon explained. It wasn't like the Boys and Girls Club where you can walk up and sign up. I grew up in a neighborhood in Southeast San Diego. This public assistance area called Bay Vista, and that was kind of the thing. The cats you grew up with, actually if anything I was always trying to get away from it. Of course during the early 90s when it was glorified, I definitely was wearing my dickies and certain colors and the chucks. Like you, the cat you grew up with and then this, you, yeah you know I'm not actually, actually if anything I was always trying to get away from it. It was glorified, I definitely was wearing my my dickies and yeah. you know certain colors and the chucks. Was it a was it a crip set, blood set? It was, it was a blood set. Blood. Nick Cannon emphasized that he never tried to glamorize the gang lifestyle. He revealed that it was a blood set he grew up around, but he always aimed to steer clear of that life. It was a blood set, but it was one of those things where that's the area that I grew up in. He said, "I mean, even if you think of Southeast San Diego, the majority of the people from down there are from different blood sets." So it was one of those things where I never even tried to glorify that because I felt like I got out of that unscathed. I mean, I lost a lot of friends to senseless gang violence. A lot of people still locked up right now. So I always tried to downplay it and be like that cat that was allowed to get away from it. It was one of those things where I never even tried to glorify that because I felt like, you know, I, I got out of that unscathed. I mean, I lost a lot of friends uh, to, you know, senseless gang violence. Nick Cannon had a defining moment when he realized that pursuing a career in entertainment was his ticket out of the dangerous streets of Southeast San Diego. He spoke about that pivotal time when the choice between staying in his violent neighborhood or chasing his dreams in Hollywood became clear. Quote, I remember that day, Cannon recalled when asked about a time he was shot at. It was interesting too because it was a time actually during high school where I felt like I was at a crossroads. I actually remember even having this conversation with my family. Like yo, a lot of my my friends are getting shot. A lot of people I know close to me are dying. I have an opportunity to be in this entertainment thing and obviously everybody wants to be successful at something. There's drive-bys at your school and you're going to football games and not really making it home. And the next day you can take a train ride to Los Angeles and don't have to deal with any of that because you're in Hollywood. Yo man, once Nickelodeon called I locked in, I forgot about all of that stuff. I remember even having this conversation with my family like, yo, a lot of my friends are getting shot. A lot of people I know close to me are dying. I have an opportunity to be in this entertainment thing. The next day you can, you know, take a, a train ride to Los Angeles and mm -hmm. don't have to deal with any of that because you're in Hollywood. 
Yo, man, when, once Nickelodeon called, I locked in. I, lo I forgot about all of that all stuff. That. To paint a clearer picture, let's dive into the notorious gang world Nick was associated with, the Lincoln Park Bloods. The Lincoln Park Bloods are one of the most infamous gangs with deep roots in the Lincoln Park region of Southeast San Diego. Originally, the gang was known as Paul Lowe's Control back in the 1970s. As the years went by, it morphed into the Lincoln Park Pyro Sindo Mob in the late 70s, and eventually became the Lincoln Park Bloods around 1986. Their turf includes areas near Logan Avenue and around John F. Kennedy, which they call Lincoln Park. When you think of the Bloods, you probably picture their traditional colors, red or burgundy. But the Lincoln Park Bloods added a twist by incorporating green into their gang colors alongside the usual red. This gang even created a deadly clique known as the Termite Squad, responsible for a significant portion of the gang-related homicides. Drawing comparisons to the infamous Italian Inc. In the early 1980s, the Lincoln Park Pyrus had an alliance with the Skyline Pyrus. However, the Prec epidemic in 1984 strained their relationship, leading to violent drive by shootings and the Lincoln Park Bloods have been notorious for producing figures like the rapper Mitchie Slick and, of course, Nick Cannon's father, James Cannon. In fact, it was Mitchie Slick who confirmed the news about Nick's father being one of the founding members of the gang. His pops is one of the first Shit. 10 homies from my turf, you feel me? Whoa. Yeah, bar. Oh, yeah. Nick Cannon Pops is one of the original Blink of Park Bloods. But despite having been a gangbanger himself, Nick Cannon's father made sure his son never followed in his footsteps. James met Nick's mother Beth through a mutual friend while they were still in high school. As James recounted to the son, they first connected at a New Year's party on January 1st, 1980, and just two weeks later, the teenagers learned that they were expecting a child together. Quote, I met Beth January 1st at a friend's house. She was pregnant by the 17th, James told the outlet. I was young, she was more mature. Ahead of Nick's arrival, James and Beth had to figure out how to handle their unexpected pregnancy. Quote, I was in church. I was like, we've got to talk about this, James said to the son, but I was not ready to get married. Beth gave birth to Nick on October 8th, 1980 in San Diego, California. Soon after, James and Beth went their separate ways. She wanted to go on and do her thing. James explained to the publication, quote, she let Nick come and live with me and my mom at two months old. Nick was then raised by his paternal grandparents, James Ernest Cannon Sr. and his wife, Marie. Nick has always been close to his family, especially his grandfather, James Sr. When James Sr. passed away on May 21st, 2016, Nick shared his grief on Instagram, giving fans a glimpse into his family life. Seven years later, Nick marked his grandfather's birthday with an emotional tribute. Quote, my mentor, my namesake, my teacher, my foundation, my father of all fathers, now my angel, he wrote, love and miss you dearly, rest in paradise with the most high, happy heavenly birthday pop, aka lonesome, Nick added. Over the following years, James had four more sons, Caleb, Gabriel, Reuben, and Javen with another woman. Despite the split, Nick has always been on good terms with his younger siblings. In the summer of 2023, his brother Gabriel even won season two of ABC's celebrity relative reality show Claim to Fame. Meanwhile, Javen has collaborated with Nick on several projects, including as a consultant on Wild and Now and Future Superstars. James has maintained positive relationships with both Beth and the mother of his four sons. These two women, I had no messy issues with them, he told the son. Growing up, James made a concerted effort to keep Nick away from gang culture that was prevalent in their hometown. Speaking to DJ Vlad, in 2018, Nick revealed how his dad turned his focus toward journalism. My dad, the way he felt like he kept me out of trouble was through the media. Whether through public access television, which he had his ministry show on, or through writing, Nick said. He continued, or going out and doing community journalism like reporting on things that are happening in the community with the police. He had me doing this type of stuff before I was a teenager. My dad went with me the way he felt like he kept me out of trouble is through the media, you know? So whether through public access television, which he had his uh, ministry show on, through writing. Today, James continues his outreach to youth through his work in the publication division of Nick's eponymous foundation. Through my foundation, he's been keeping that work going and has been doing things with podcasts as well as radio shows and specifically this book division, Nick said. The division is dedicated to incorporating a more diverse community of voices into the publishing world. He had me doing this type of stuff like before I was a teenager. So Ooh. through my foundation, he's kind of been keeping that work going and you know, He's, uh, he's doing things with podcasts, 
as well as radio shows. And James's turnaround story is nothing short of miraculous. Nick explained that his father got locked up as a teenager, but during that process, he turned his life around by giving his life to the Lord. Nick described it as a miraculous story, expressing how proud his dad's entire family and community were of him for overcoming his challenges and going off to college. Nick also shared the touching memory of being in the audience when his dad graduated high school. Yeah, my dad is what we consider in our neighborhood a real OG. Like, the things he had to overcome and the obstacles, and you know, now he's been a man of the community, but yeah, he, he was one of them guys. Uh, he got locked up, and then I think during that process, you know, gave his life to the Lord. Okay. Uh, at an early age, though, like really even, you know. Like early 20s? Even before that, went on to college, and he had this miraculous story of like, one of the most dangerous and, and gangster dudes in the neighborhood graduated high school and went off to college and like the whole community was proud of him for that. Apart from almost getting caught up in gang life, Nick Cannon has faced a lot of other challenges throughout his life and career. One big controversy that made headlines was when he was accused of perpetuating stereotypes. Back in 2014, Nick Cannon found himself in hot water for his portrayal of a white character named Connor Smallnut. To promote his album White People Party Music, Nick decided to put on white makeup, snap some pictures, and posted the content on his Instagram with the caption, it's official, I'm white. The reaction was swift and divided. Some people felt that Nick's white face was just as offensive as blackface. Critics argued that since it's widely considered wrong for white people to appear in blackface, the same should apply to Cannon doing whiteface. But Nick stood his ground and defended the character during an appearance on Good Morning America where he pointed out that wearing white and blackface are not the same. Quote, they're using this term whiteface like I don't even know what that is, Cannon said via ABC News. I know blackface was a term that was created in 1869 to describe offensive minstrel shows. Whiteface, if you look it up and Google it, it's a ski slope in upstate New York. I was doing a character impression. Blackface is about oppression. There's a big difference between humor and hatred. Nick echoed these sentiments during a chat with Hello Beautiful about the controversy. Quote, there's a big difference between impression and oppression. So if people don't understand that, I have no words for them, he said, the conversation is over. On top of that, Nick has also had his share of health scares. According to the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, lupus is an autoimmune disorder that can cause inflammation throughout your body, including in your joints, skin, blood vessels, and organs. While women are disproportionately affected by this incurable disease, with only 10% of men getting it, Nick Cannon is among that smaller percentage of men who have lupus. He found out about his condition condition after suffering from acute renal failure. In January 2012, he had to undergo surgery for his illness as reported by The Hollywood Reporter. The next month, Cannon shared on 92.3 Now via Daily News that he'd been diagnosed with an enlarged heart as well as blood clots in his lungs. He later spoke to people and explained that the renal failure was related to his lupus diagnosis while the kidney failure had caused the blood clots. The blood clot thing was probably the scariest, Cannon explained. I thought I was getting better and then that happened, so that kind of came out of nowhere. I feel blessed to be alive. If I wasn't discovered, I don't know what the outcome would have been. But that wasn't the end of Nick's health issues. In 2016, he was hospitalized again due to a flare-up related to lupus. He took to social media to update his fans, writing, quote, For all who have been trying to contact me the last few days, this is where I've been, and I will be in the hospital throughout Christmas. Really what it is, it's a, a rare form of lupus that's just attacking my kidneys. Nick has also faced quite a few bumps in his career road. Take, for instance, his decision to quit a super lucrative gig. Nick started hosting NBC's America's Got Talent in 2009, and by 2017, he was raking in about $70,000 per episode, according to Celebrity Net Worth. But in 2017, Nick decided to walk away from the seemingly cushy job. So what led to this bold move? It all stemmed from some jokes he made during his Showtime comedy special, Stand Up, Don't Shoot. In the special, Nick used a racial epithet and mentioned NBC multiple times, which which didn't sit well with the network. He also accused NBC of trying to change his image and make it harder for him to be controversial on stage. I was to be punished for a joke, Nick wrote on his Facebook page via The Hollywood Reporter. It was brought to my attention by my team that NBC believed that I was in breach of contract because I had disparaged their brand. I will not be silenced, controlled, or treated like a piece of property. 
There is no amount of money worth my dignity or my integrity, Nick elaborated on his decision to leave AGT during a chat with Kevin Frazier on Entertainment Tonight, saying, quote, when people start to put restraints on my creativity as an artist, I just have to stand on my square and stand for something. Money isn't one of the things that moves me or inspires me. Then there's his long-standing feud with Eminem. Did Eminem and Mariah Carey ever date? According to Eminem, they did. Mariah Carey, however, says otherwise. This discrepancy sparked an all-out war. It all started when Eminem dissed Mariah in his 2009 song Bagpipes from Baghdad, where he also insulted Nick Cannon, who was married to Mariah at the time. Following the song's release, Nick fired back on Tumblr via Billboard, implying he'd beat up Eminem, writing, It's going to take a corny, whack rapping boy toy from Nickelodeon to set you straight. And who can forget Mariah's classic Eminem diss track, Obsessed? where she sang, We never were, so why you trippin'? You a mom and pop, I'm a corporation. I'm the press conference, you a conversation. The beef reignited in 2019 after Nick spoke about it on T.I.'s podcast, Expeditiously. Nick mentioned he was eager to defend his ex-wife's honor during the feud, prompting Eminem to respond on rapper Fat Joe's song, Lord Above. In the track, Eminem rapped lines like, Almost got my caboose kicked. Fool quit, you not gonna do S. Nick responded to Eminem's verse on social media before dropping his own distro tracks, The Invitation, and Cancelled Invitation. However, by October 2021, Nick shared on his talk show that he and Eminem had buried the hatchet with a little help from Fat Joe. Looks like that long-standing mess is finally water under the bridge. Another significant controversy hit Nick in 2020 when he made anti-Semitic remarks on Cannon's Glass podcast. Nick, in conversation with former Public Enemy member Professor Griff, perpetuated harmful Jewish stereotypes and conspiracy theories. Viacom CBS the company backing his MTV show Wild and Out decided to cut ties with him. Viacom CBS condemns bigotry of any kind, and we categorically denounce all forms of anti-Semitism, the company said in a statement published by Deadline. While we support ongoing education and dialogue in the fight against bigotry, we are deeply troubled that Nick has failed to acknowledge or apologize for perpetuating anti-Semitism, and we are terminating our relationship with him. Now, with that new fallout for Nick Cannon, the actor, rapper, and television host fired by Viacom overnight following racial and anti-Semitic comments he made on his podcast. Initially, Nick slammed Viacom CBS for firing him and demanded sole ownership of Wild Now. However, he later had a change of heart and apologized to the Jewish community, acknowledging that his words reinforced the worst stereotypes of a proud and magnificent people. As reported by Variety, Nick also engaged in conversations with Jewish leaders to better understand why his remarks were harmful. He even took a temporary break from his radio hosting duties on Power 106. By February 2021, Page Six reported that Nick was rehired by Viacom CBS and Wild Now was set to return. Also, his friend died by suicide. Nick Cannon has certainly had better years than 2020. It wasn't just the pandemic that made things rough for him. He was also drowning in backlash over his anti-Semitic remarks. I hurt an entire community and it pained me to my core. I thought it couldn't get any worse, he tweeted on July 16, 2020. Then I watched my own community turn on me and call me a sellout for apologizing. Good night, enjoy Earth. Just a few days after that heavy tweet, Nick's world was shaken even more. Ryan Bowers, a rapper signed to Cannon's company, Incredible Entertainment, died by on July 18, 2020, at just 24 years old. Quote, just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, 2020 is definitely the most effed up year I've ever witnessed. Cannon wrote next to a photo of him and Bowers together. I've said it once and I will say it again, this was the strongest dude I've ever met. Nick also hinted at his own struggles, recalling barely rising from my own dark contemplation of continuing my physical existence on this planet. He later deleted the post, but the pain and grief he expressed were palpable. On top of all that, Nick's family dynamics have also been a hot topic of discussion. With 12 children from 6 different women, including 4 born within 10 months, Cannon has faced a lot of criticism. While some see nothing wrong with his lifestyle, others have been quick to judge. Critics argue that having so many kids with different women is irresponsible and could leave the children feeling fatherless, no matter how much money is thrown at them. Nick, however, passionately defends his choices. Anybody who knows me, man, and every single one of my kids, I'm at every basketball game, every martial arts practice, and people don't understand how I do it. But that's literally my children are my priority, he said. He discussed his family during an appearance on The Dr. Oz Show in November 2021, where he shared, I don't know how I'll feel 
feel in five years. I don't know if I'm going to find love again. You never understand what the universe is going to present to you. Then there was the heartbreaking loss of his son, Zen. On December 7th, 2021, Nick shared the devastating news that his youngest son, Zen Scott Cannon, had died of a brain tumor at just five months old. Over the weekend, I lost my youngest son to a condition called hydrocephalus. That was pretty much an invasive midline brain tumor, brain cancer, he announced on the Nick Cannon show. Initially, Nick and Zen's mom thought Zen had a sinus issue, but doctors later discovered fluid in his brain, which required surgery. Zen seemed to be okay for a while after the procedure, but his condition worsened on Thanksgiving 2021. Nick, visibly emotional, recounted holding his son for the last time just a few days later. He also spoke highly of Zen's mother, Alyssa Scott, calling her the strongest woman I've ever seen. Despite the pain and heartbreak, Nick praised her for always being the best mom. Alyssa honored Zen in an Instagram post writing, quote, it has been an honor and privilege being your mommy. I will love you for eternity. But despite everything, Nick Cannon is still one of Hollywood's top celebrities, which probably wouldn't have been possible if he had gone down the gang route instead.